Today, I would like to talk to you about the alms video I'd like to share. We have a drone video, and it was taken yesterday, and I wanted to uh, immediately record something about it, but uh, uh, we could not schedule uh, all the proper equipment in the studio. So I'd like to make a small, small talk about alms again. You might think we, we talk about food a little too much, but you know, we have to, we have to eat. <laughs> and uh, this can be uh, a major part of the, the monk life. You know, one time I had talked about, in the past, I had talked about uh, the simple life, about being light in duties, and having a simple life in the ascetic life. And I remember one time when I was in Hawaii, when I was in Kauai Island, in Hawaii. And I was living at uh, one person's place. And he was, he was like a friend of, of mine, and, and I was camping on his property. I had a, I had a, a, a tent on a platform. And we were very friendly, and you know, I came back from my, my alms round, and he asked me how my day was. I said, yeah, it was a good day. I got food. It was good. And then he starts laughing. He starts laughing. I mean, for like a long time, I'm just like, you know, I'm like waiting, you know, for him to stop laughing. Maybe a minute. You know, a minute's a long time to laugh. He was like laughing for like a minute straight, maybe. It's a long time. He calms down and I ask him, what's so funny? What's so funny? He says, you got food. And because of that, because of that, you, your day was good. All you have to do is eat and your day is good. And I think he, he started to talk about all these things that, you know, regular people have to worry about. How complicated the life is. And it was just, uh, I'm not sure if it was like an aha moment or something. It was definitely a moment of appreciation of the, the simple life. He definitely appreciated it how simple my life was and how filled with gratitude I, I could be, I could have, I could have this gratitude simply by getting enough food for the day and saying that my day was good because I was able to get food. There's sometimes, actually in Hawaii, a lot of times, I would go for alms round which included going to the village, which was a long process, walking around in the village, which is another hour and a half process. And then I would have to eat in the village. I'd find a tree to sit under or whatever, and I would eat my food, and then I would make my way back. It was a four or five hour process, almost every day. But that's all I had to do. That was my job. It was a simple life. And it's a life of, of gratitude and, and reflection. And when we're on our way to get our, our food, we, we can use that time to, to meditate. It's not like downtime. We can meditate. We can meditate while we're walking. We can meditate while we're giving the blessings, etc becomes a very nice experience. And people can, people can give, have an opportunity to give, have an opportunity to practice compassion, generosity, 
wishing loving kindness. And we can be that object for them to, to do good. But there's also a necessity for that. We have to eat. And so we have, we have this relationship with how we live and how we collect our food and, and getting what we need in order to survive for the monk life. And I find it very inspiring. And so I like to share things that inspire people about the monk life. There may be some people who read my, my blog on AmericanMonk.org or people who subscribe to my, my channel on YouTube or people who watch my videos on Facebook. They might get the feeling that it might be good to learn how to meditate or even more to, to explore the possibility of monasticism to ordain as a, as a monk or, or as a nun, as a sayale in the Burmese tradition or something like that, as a bhikkhu in the Theravada tradition. And if that's not possible, some of you likely still have that desire or wish to become a bhikkhu in the future. And perhaps in the future, in the next life, maybe your life is a little too filled, too much filled with obligations that prevent you from doing such things. Or you have too many things that you're attached to where you can't detach from in order to ordain. But perhaps in, an, in a future life, some seeds can be planted. And you know that when you die, when you die, if you do wholesome things and you make a wish in order to, uh, coupled with, these, with this wholesome wish, you have good wholesome karma combined with a wholesome wish, at your near-death moment that can arise. That can arise and that can be the cause for how your whole next life how your whole next life is to, to unfold almost. It'll be in your subconscious stream, what we call the Bhavanga. Your Patisandi and the Bhavanga and the Chuti, they're all the same in your near-death moment before that. They're all the same, they take the same object. They have the same five past causes, which give the, the five results. And so it can be beneficial in this way when you apply the cause and effect and apply the cause and effect with samsara, past, present, and future lives. It can be very beneficial when you think like this. Or when you're someone like myself, giving the Dhamma talk with this in mind and explaining it to you. So there's always a benefit for something light, like just telling you about food. And that was like one of the complaints. But it's a major part of the, of the monastic life because it's one of our main jobs. We have to eat. And like I said before, I spent four hours, quite often, nearly daily, when I was living in Hawaii to get my food. Even today, yesterday and today. I started at 6.30. I started at 6.30 in the morning, and by the time I finish, it's probably about 8.30, quarter to nine. After I finish eating, clean up and ready to go back to my kuti. It's nearly a quarter to nine, I think. So that's uh, 
what, two hours and 15 minutes. And that's with the village just down the road. This is easy. And my, my robes are all sweaty from carrying my bowl and walking in the early morning sunlight. It's not even hot yet, but I'm still working up a sweat. So it's our job. It's what we have to do. It's our main thing. But we can meditate while we're doing this. I find it a very wonderful practice. And so I have a drone video. There's, there's a monk who has a drone. And we have some older pictures of some older videos of getting food. And I'll probably mix that in so you can see some things. And I have a video of what, what it looks like, uh, what the food looks like from my bowl, and setting it out for other people. And I have another video of showing how it gets used. And I'll also mention a few quotes from the suttas. We'll talk about the Itivuttaka, number 75. It's called the, the Rainless Cloud. The Chula Gosinga Sutta from the Maji Manikaya. We'll talk about the basic chant of using the food. And we'll talk about the, the very famous Dhammapada, a verse which also mentions uh, food. It'll be a short talk, although maybe it's turning into a longer talk. <laughs> it's my habit. <laughs> but it's just something nice to see, something nice to remind you, and something nice to reflect on. And as I said before, maybe it could inspire you. It could inspire you to do something in this life. And if not in this life, maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. So before we start a Dhamma talk, we, we always uh, pay respect and uh, show our reverence to the Buddha. Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase And so it's a rainy season. So it'd be nice to talk about the rain. There's a sutta in Itivuttaka number 75, the rainless cloud. We'll skip over the Pali. But there are three types of rain or three, three types of clouds. The first is this cloud that doesn't give any rain. The second one is a cloud that just, it only rains in a certain area. You know, it's like a small rain cloud, a, rain, a regional rain cloud. It only rains over a village. And then there's the third one, which rains everywhere. The, the simile that is given is in terms of donation. There are, there are samana and brahmana, so we could say that there's like monks and there's priests and there's poor people and there's wanderers and there's be beggars, etc. And there are different types of donations that can be given. We have the basic 10, uh, I say basic, but there's 10 of them, yeah. The standard 10, we could say. The food, drink, clothing, vehicles. Vehicles means like uh, anything to do with transportation, like, like slippers, even to shoes, you know, flip-flops. But of course, rides, etc. Garlands, so food, drink, clothing, vehicles. Garlands, fragrance, makeup, bed, housing, and lighting. And sometimes we... We don't appreciate the light. We offer candles to the Buddha. You know, we think that it's stupid. You know, in the, 
We don't know the purpose of it. It's not stupid. We don't know the purpose of it because we have electricity and we don't appreciate what it's like to not have light. <laughs> we offer to the Buddha, right? So that the Buddha gets the light. It's closest to him so he can see what's going on. When you do that, it actually helps your eyes, actually. And you get that uh, cause and effect back. Light also can represent wisdom. We also have the four requisites. The four requisites. We have uh, chivira dana. This is the, the robes, chivira. We have the pindabata dana. This is the, the alms food. What we will be spending the most time on today. We have senasana dana. Senasana dana is... Your, your lodging, the kuti, the meditation hut, the dwelling place. And then we have gilana pachaya besajja parikaro. This is the medicine requisites, everything to do with medicine and health. So you have the different types of people that you can give to, and you have the different types of donations that you can give to. We have three types of clouds. We have one that doesn't give any rain. We have another that, do, that does give, but not everywhere. And then we have the third type that gives rain. And it gives everywhere. And now you may understand what it's about. And so the first one, they don't give any, anything to anyone. The second one, they, they give only, only to some, one or, or just a few, while ignoring the others. And the third is most beautiful. They give wherever it's needed, all the time. To all types. You know, some people... They appreciate the, the vinya, they appreciate the vinya, but they, sometimes they say, oh, I'm never going to give to monks that uh, don't uh, follow the rule on money. They're, they're using money and so they're not going to give. No, you should give. You should give. But give allowable, allowable requisites. Give allowable gifts to the monks. This is what's most important. By doing that, you can encourage people to follow the rules correctly. It's very important to, to, get the, the, to get the donations, to get the ability to, if you are the donor, to actually get it through right livelihood whatever you're donating, through right livelihood, through right means. You don't, rob a, you don't rob a store in order to get the money in order to donate. <laughs> in the same way, you, your livelihood should be done uh, through, the, through the proper modes of livelihood. As I said before, you know, there's, there's specific uh, categories of, of right livelihood, but in general, we could say that there's the five precepts and you're not it's not related to breaking the five precepts, not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in sexual misconduct, not to lie, not to take intoxicants. We should support uh, all monks, but not only that, we should support all people who are in need. We should support all, all people, all beings that are in need. You know, it's very beautiful when it talks about the third rain, rain cloud, the one that gives everywhere. It talks about uh, filling up the, val the valleys and with rain and just going all the way up to the hillside. Because uh, the suttas from, from this book are very poetic and meaningful. And so it can be very beautiful. 
In the Chula Gosinga Sutta, it's called the Shorter Discourse of Gosinga, he talks about the three monks, three bhikkhus, who are living harmoniously. And the Buddha, he comes to, to visit these monks. At first, the gatekeeper, <laughs> the gatekeeper didn't recognize the Buddha and said, no, 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 you cannot come here. We have uh, three really good monks who are practicing very harmoniously. Don't come. <laughs> they didn't, he didn't recognize the, the Buddha. They had a kapiya. But uh, everything got settled and the Buddha came. And they said that they're, they're living harmoniously like milk and water, blending like milk and water. It's a very beautiful simile. They always use, they use this simile often, or it's very famous at least. And the Buddha, he asks them, it's one of the first questions he asks. He says, are you, are you, getting, are you getting along? Are you getting, are you getting the alms food without any trouble? You know, as I said before in Kauai, it wasn't always easy. But I got food every day. I got food every day. And often my chore was getting food. And if I got food, I was happy. That's all I had to do. Most of the time, that was all I had to do. And that was what made me happy. And the Buddha, he... He asked that question. He says, are you getting food? Because it's a major part of the, of the monk life. If you don't have food, then everything else goes wrong. <laughs> then he asked, you know, how they're getting along and how their life is. First, you have to take care of the basic necessities. And then you can work on the, the details of being a monk in the practice of being a monk. You can put them aside, actually, for, for a little bit, but in the end, you have to eat. And this is a, an important part of, of Buddhism. The Buddha, he didn't, the Bodhisatta, he didn't eat <laughs> for a long time. There's a, there's a statue of the, of the Bodhisatta. is before he became a, a Buddha, and he's like a skeleton because he, he barely ate anything barely enough to even support his life faculty. And then later he, he understood that you need to eat, but you don't need to eat three meals a day. We, we eat in one part of the day before solar noon. Before solar noon, we can eat. After the dawn rise and before the solar noon, the highest part of the, of the sun, but we can eat. We sort of, we, we do intermittent fasting. We've been doing this since the time of the Buddha. It's nothing new. It's quite, uh, quite popular these days. But it's something that Buddhist monks have been doing all the time. And some people practice one meal. They, they eat one meal. Because if you want your, if you want your food, you have, to, you have to go out and get it. So if you, you know, like I said, it takes four hours for me to get my meal. You, sometimes you don't have time. You only have time to collect one meal. Or you don't want to go back and forth twice, twice per day because it just takes up too much time. So depending on the lifestyle, you take one meal. Or if you have the meal offered in the monastery, you can take two meals. For me, I prefer to take a, a very small snack in the morning. And then I take uh, my main meal at lunch. And it works well when, on the weekends when I go for, alms, for, my alms, uh, for my alms round. And I come back, and then I eat, and then I'm finished. So in the, uh, in the, so in the Chula Gosinga Sutta, they said that, uh, yeah, they're getting their food. Everything's fine. And they even talked about the harmonious way of living. And they said, you know, whoever comes back first sets up the seats. They set up the drinking water. They set up the rinsing water, etc. 
And they take the, the extra food. And they put it into like a, I don't know, a vessel, some type of container for other monks to take. They take what they need and then they put the rest in, in, a, in another area, in another container. And then as each monk comes by, and there's, there's three of them together, they can also take their extra food and put it in that container. And they can also, if, they, if they're short some, they can also take from that as well. And the third monk, he does the same thing. If he has extra food, he puts it in the container. And if he's uh, uh, deficient in, uh, in certain, you know, areas, you know, like maybe there's no fruit that day, or maybe there's no protein, etc. Maybe he only got rice that day, and there's curries from the other monks, and so he can take. And the last person cleans up. So they just, they come in, they come in from their alms round, and they, they put their food out, and then uh, they, they clean up after themselves, and, and then the next monk comes, and the next monk comes, and the last person cleans up. And so at our monastery, we have a, a container for, for rice, and we have a container for, for curries. Actually, I think, I think maybe I tried to help set that up so that we don't, we don't waste anything. Or at least having them separate, separate for rice and separate for curries, I can't remember. So we have a container for the rice, we have a container for the curries. And you will see what I have collected. I can show you in the video. You'll see that I, I have a lot of food. And then you'll see that the, the, there are other monks who also go for alms round. I went with another monk. There's one monk, he comes with me. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of other monks who go for alms round. And we all sort of combined our, our curries and our rice. We put it in one place. And I always say that this food is the most expensive food. It's the most expensive food because it's, it's cooked by people who are not well off, we could say. The villagers. And times are difficult in Sri Lanka. They wake up early and they're cooking the food. You know, I leave at 6.30 in the morning. They have to cook and be ready when I arrive, maybe, I don't know, a little before 7. They always have hot food for me. They always, they always usually give it while, while it's hot. They give it, so they're cooking. They're cooking a lot. It's a big thing for them to do. And for that reason, we say it's the most expensive even though we have a full supported kitchen here, we have, we have a professional chef. He's got like the coat, he has like the coat with the pocket and the spoon and everything. But we always say that this is the most expensive. And the monks, myself included, when the opportunity arises to, to take this food, we automatically know what is from the village just by looking at it. And you can see also in the video. You can see that, uh, that it's different. And so we always make a point to take this food first, not because it's, it's expensive in terms of its quality and taste, but we know it's expensive in terms of the amount of effort, faith, and love that went into the cooking the food. Of course, in the monastery, the donors have faith and love in the workers, so we have very good workers, yeah. But I don't know. We'd say it's different. And so we make it a, a point to, to eat that food first. And normally I, don't, uh, I, I donate my food and I don't really see what's going on, but I wanted to show you what's going on with the food. And you can see that the food is, the, the, the alms food that we, we present is very large. It's large quantities. 
But nevertheless, it's the first food to go empty. It's the first food to get to go empty first before the other curries and the rices, etc. It's very beautiful, actually. We, we never have extra food. Even though we have extra food, all the food gets used. We have workers, they eat at night, they, they have lunch, etc. And uh, when, I, when I took the picture, actually, when I took the video, you, you, there was still maybe a half hour or an hour left in the, in the meal time as well. So once, my, once the, the alms food was finished, I, my job was finished, <laughs> I could go back to my kuti. Normally, I just go back to my kuti after I finish eating early in the morning. As I said before, I can finish around uh, quarter to nine. And so I can have the whole day by myself. We have a chant. We have a chant for the Pindapata. It's from the Sabasava Sutta. The Majjhima Nikaya. It's the second. It's the second sutta. We chant this every day. I already chanted it today, actually. This is my second time chanting it. It's very famous and should be chanted by any monastic every day. It's required, actually. Pati sankha yoni so pindapatam pati sevami neva devaya namadaya namandanaya navipusanaya yava deva imasa kaya satitiya yapanaya vihim supratiya brahmacharya nugahaya iti parananca vedanam pati angami Navancha Vedanam Naupadesami Yachacha me Pavisati Navajata Chapasu Vyarochati. We chant this every day. Actually, for the four requisites, we chant that wisely reflecting, I use this alms food not for fun, not for pleasure, not for fattening, not for beautification, only for the nourishment and maintenance of this body for keeping it healthy, for helping with the holy life. Thinking thus, I shall destroy these old feelings of hunger and not produce these new feelings of overeating. Thus there will be this freedom from physical discomfort and living at ease. In the Dhammapada, verse number 185, we say this every time after the Patimoka, every Uposita, we always chant this as a group. Not every monastery, but maybe, maybe most monasteries that do the Patimoka will, will chant these after the Patimoka. Anupavado, Anupagato, Patimoke, Chesamvaro, Matanyuta, Chepatasmim. Patanche sayanasanam adichitte che ayogo etam buddhanasasanam. Not despising, not harming, restraint according to the Buddhist monastic code, the discipline, moderation in food, dwelling in solitude, devotion to meditation. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Etam buddhanasasanam. So it's very popular after the Bhati Moka because it also mentions the uh, Bhati Moka Samvaro, the restraint in the Bhati Moka, following the rules. The Bhati Moka should be chanted every two weeks in full, unless there are dangers. But the other thing you might have noticed was moderation in food, in eating. Matanyuta chabhattas mim. Knowing your measure, knowing how much you can eat, that gives you that comfort, as we said in the previous chant from the Sabhasava Sutta, that you have to eat to get rid of the hunger. But you want to make sure that you're not going to overeat to give a new feeling of overeating. You know, recently this, this one lady, she's going to become a Sayale when I go to America soon. <laughs> she told me that she, she overate. 
I remember when I was first uh, joining the, the monasteries, they give you this big buffet spread of, of food. And what happens is you, you, you have like all these different types of curries and dishes that you can, you can try and you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and all of a sudden your bowl is, your bowl is very big and all of a sudden your bowl is filled, filled with more food than you can possibly eat. You know, we say the eyes are bigger than the stomach. So we have to be very, very careful. You know, every time, every time I take my food from the, from the line, almost every time, I'm like half crying inside. I want to take more. <laughs> but I know, I know I should only take this amount. And actually before, before I st start taking my food, I look down the line and I try to understand what is ahead. That's actually one of, the, one of my secrets. Is I look, I look ahead. You know, if you're just looking in front of you, you come here, you come here, you come here, you come here. So actually I, I look at the whole line, I sort of gauge, okay, I'm gonna take some of this and this and this and this and this. And I understand that there's, uh, there's many curries and I'll just take smaller amounts of each or something like that. Or if there's only a few curries, I'll, 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 take, uh, I'll take more of each, of each curry, etc. And having the right proportions, etc., from rice and curries and beans, etc. So I look ahead, actually. It's one of the tricks. One of the tricks I discovered to, to take only what I eat because I don't like to waste food. I don't like to waste food, that's how I was brought up. If you touch it, the family, we had a rule. If you touch it, you take it. If you take it, you eat it. <laughs> we, always had to, we always had to clear our plate when I was growing up. And so when I became a, before I even, uh, before I even became a monk, I was like an anagarika and I remember it was very, it was very painful to go through the line because I would, I would force myself to eat what I took and I was taking too much in the beginning. It was very painful and I learned the hard way how to have a moderation in eating. As the chant says, we want to get rid of the feeling of hunger and we want to not have a new feeling. That new feeling is overeating. It takes time as monastic to learn how to be moderate in eating and to have the right amount. And so, you know, in the video you can see, I forgot to mention, in the video you can see that the, the food is, is spread out and the people are taking the food. They're taking the, the alms food first before they take any of the other food. Matter of fact, I arrange to have the alms food at the beginning of the line. We make sure that it gets taken first. Because if you're taking the other food and you have the right amount and then at the very end you see the, the alms food, you want to take from there, but you know you already have the right amount. So we put it at the front of the line so that people know it's there first. It's not just myself who takes it. It's a lot of the monks. They'll take from there first. And so I, I showed you a drone video while I was talking, and I showed you some older pictures of getting food, and I showed you uh, what comes from my bowl and what comes from the other monk's bowl that I went with, and I showed you how it gets combined with the other, with the other monks. And I showed you some videos of how it gets used, and the other monks are taking from that, that curry container. And I mentioned a few quotes from the suttas, from the Itivuttaka number 75, the rainless cloud, the Chulagosinga Sutta, the basic chant on using the, the alms food, and from the Dhammapada, the Dhammapada verse 185 highlighting moderation in eating and restraint in the, in the Patimokha, something we chant every, every two weeks after the Patimokha, after the 227 rules. We still have more chanting to do.
Only one person chants the rules by himself. And then we chant as a group afterwards. So this turned out to be something special. Actually, I thought this would be a small talk, nothing special. But I talked a lot. I hope that it's something nice to, re to remind you about the, about the monk life, what's special about it, and something to remind you or to reflect on for your own future in giving and for your own future of maybe being a future receiver as a monk. And I want this to inspire you to give, and not just to monks, like a rain cloud that fills the, that drenches the whole entire earth, fills up the valleys. And gives not just to a selected few, but give to all, all of those who need it. May you have such wholesome desire to do so. Or even better, to become a monk on the other side. May you use this good karma from listening to this Dhamma talk, perhaps getting inspired, getting a peaceful mind that comes with donation, dana, and sila, and using that peaceful mind to develop concentration. And with that concentration, you develop insight into mind and matter and their past causes, future effects, and trying to see beyond the causes so you can reach Nibbana safely and quickly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.